today we are going to discuss about the concept of meaning and how this meaning is related with uh, the notion of mind that is the central topic that I will be discussing today. Now, since we have been discussing about Searle and his contemporaries like Forder, Chomsky and many others who have also worked in philosophy of language and philosophy of mind. We would like to examine Searle's theory of mind and meaning vis a vis the Fodorian and the Chomskyan notion of meaning and the mind. Now, according to Searle, meaning is related with the notion of mind. It is related because the mind is logically prior, prior to the concept of meaning. Now, Searle does not accept this proposition that meaning is there in the mind. He does not accept this idea that meaning is in the mind, rather mind helps in articulating the meaning. In other words, it is the representational it is the representational feature of the mind articulates the expression and the expression is directed towards the world, meaning thereby the world is represented by mind vis a vis the language. So, language is not a kind of a a primordial no concept, language has evolved, historically it has evolved and as we all know that uh, Searle is uh, presupposing the evolutionary biology, Searle's biological naturalism presupposes two scientific theories. One is the evolutionary biology and the atomic theory of matter. So, if you keep these two presuppositions in your mind and think what is Searlean approach to explain the nature of meaning. So, in that context language is a secondary phenomenon, it has evolved along with it has evolved after the evolution of many intentional complex mental states. So, mental states are linguistic in nature, but mental states are not necessarily. Now, if language has evolved in the process, then the mind is primary evolute and then you have language. So, what is mind as we have discussed earlier? Mind is nothing but the concatenation of certain intentional states. Now, these intentional states have contained. So, the structure of intentional states if you remember correctly has a content and this content is linguistic in nature. So, the content is linguistic because the intentional states represent things in the world or the objects in the world or the state of affairs in the world. Now, this aboutness, aboutness that is embedded in the structure of an intentional state that every intentional state is directed towards the world. Now, this directedness involves a content which is linguistic. This content being linguistic can also be called the semantic content. So, there are mental states, 
mental states have a structure. So, for example, when I have the desire, so for example, the desire to have something, desire of something, so or desire is about something. Now, this aboutness shows intentionality. So, intentionality is one of the evolutes or one of the features which has basically related to life. It is intrinsically related to life. Now, this intrinsic relationship does not presuppose that it has the semantic content. So, language does not come along with intentionality. It is intentionality or the intentional attitude of human mind talks about meaning, talks about the semantic content that is part of the intentional state. So, today we are mostly interested to talk about what is meaning, what is representation and how meaning is part of the mind and meaning is also related to this mind world relationship. So, when we talk about the intentional relationship between the mind and the world, we also need to see how language plays a kind of a medium, a connecting principle between the mind and the world. I say it connecting principle in the sense that the semantic element of intentional states are fundamental for the semantic content is fundamental to meaning or to the expression and also to the intentional states. So, in that sense we need to find out how language or meaning is placed when we talk about this world mind relationship. So, therefore, the title of my lecture today is about language representation and meaning. Meaning is primarily representational. So, the representational theory of meaning has a long history. It starts from Prege philosophy of sense and a reference or early Wittgenstein's notion of picture theory of meaning. So, sir in intentionality very clearly says that I am talking about intentionality, I am talking about philosophy of language in continuation with uh, the Fregean Wittgensteinian analytic tradition. Sell talks about intentionality and meaning referring to the Fregean Wittgensteinian analytic tradition. Now, if that is the case, one finds how the concept of representation, particularly the linguistic representation has been very strongly advocated by Frege and Wittgenstein, when Wittgenstein says language is the picture of reality. It is through language and language alone we can represent the world. So, language has the potential to represent the world. So, the structure of language must be taken into account. What is the structure of language that represents the world? Is there a structure or what kind of representation it is? If somebody asks this kind of questions, what kind of representation it is, then the notion of the structure of representation becomes important. So, meaning 
is basically representational, meaning it is related to words or sentences or expressions, meaning it is related to thoughts. Now, the representational structure in which meaning is stated is something very important for all of us to understand, if we are interested in understanding the structure of representation or the structure of language or the structure of intentional states. Now, understanding the meaning is broadly speaking about understanding the language. So, when we talk about meaning, we cannot talk about meaning if we do not talk about language, the linguistic life that every individual human beings live. So, language is an important concept to speak about, to explain how meaning is possible. So, language as meaning belong to the same logical space as do logic and logical form. This I am pointing out referring to the representational theory of language advocated by L. Wittgenstein. When Wittgenstein says the language represents the world, the propositions are the pictures of the world, he thinks that propositions has some kind of grammatical structure or logical structure, logical form of the propositions and the state of affairs that it that the proposition represents also has some kind of a structure and that is logical in nature. And both language and the world share logical form, hence this representation is possible. So, when we talk about logical space, the existence of facts in the logical space, meaning belong to logical facts. So, meaning is a semantic fact existing in the logical space as logic exists or has a logical form. So, language and meaning belong to the same logical space. Now, let us talk about the nature of representation. There are two kinds of representations the representational theory of meaning advocated by L. Wittgenstein or L. Wittgensteinians gives importance to language, whereas Searle, Fodor and many others talk about mental representation. According to then mind is a representational entity. The intentional ability, the intentional feature of mind helps in explicating the representational structure between mind and the world. Intentionality helps in explicating the intentional structure that is embedded in the expression and the expression representing the world. So, there are mental representations, intentional states have content and this content which I said semantic content are related to or referring to the objects or a state of affairs in the world. So, there are mental representations and there are linguistic representations. Linguistic representation will talk about the logical grammatical structure which is formally analyzable, whereas the mental representation would talk about mainly we will talk about the functional computational characteristics of the mind, the ability to be represented in the formal computational machine. 
Now, when we talk about mental representation, so for example, in the case of Fodder, who is arguing for a representational theory of mind, would suggest that representational states are primary and they are there in a kind of a modular system, where mind is quite analogous to a machine. Now, the function of representational states is therefore, computational in nature in the sense that these representational states are syntactic, they are not primarily characterized by the semantic content. The semantic content can be explained by the syntactical structure of representational states. That is a kind of a Fodorian analysis of the representational uh, states and how does a representational theory of mind talk about the semantic content or explains the semantic content. Now, this, this explanation that Fodor provides is in a sense tries to understand the nature of the semantic content from the perspective of a computational theory of mind, where the syntax is primary and the semantics is secondary, because it is through syntax the semantical content of representational states are explained. Potter also talks about the causal capacity, the power of representational states or the power of the representational system that makes representation possible. But the Searlian thesis of representation is slightly different. It is different in this sense that Searle gives primacy to intentionality and intentionality helps in explaining meaning, it helps in explaining the structure of mental states and this intentionality is intrinsically related with consciousness and it cannot be duplicated by any model of it cannot be duplicated by any physical system. So, Searle argues against the computational representational theory of mind, particularly when Searle argues it out in the context of his Chinese room argument that how does human mind understands the reality and how does a computer, a machine, a physical system fails to understand the reality. It fails because it does not have a semantic ability. It fails because machine is is not primarily run by consciousness, which is intentional in nature. Now, Searle's argument is that, that the machine is not primarily an intentional agent like any other human conscious beings, 
or any other biological beings. Hence, the intentional activities of the machine and the intentional activities of human beings as a linguistic being are two different kinds of intentional activities. The intentional activities of a machine is purely syntactical, whereas the intentional activities of the human beings are semantic in nature. Because the concept of meaning is associated with understanding, experience, whereas when we talk about concept of meaning, taking Fodor's theory into account, we do not necessarily speak in that language, that is the language of experience and understanding. Whereas, in, in the Searle's theoretical framework, one finds that there is a space to talk about experience, there is a space to talk about understanding. So, human linguistic activities are essentially governed by the semantic aspect or the semantic feature of language. Whereas, the linguistic activities in the machine, the computational function of the machine is essentially governed by the syntax or certain syntactic principles of language use. So, that is the broad distinction between the two theoretical frameworks that talk about mental representations. So, today we will try to understand that what is this intentional ability and how does human mind represent things. But before that, let us briefly talk about linguistic representation. Now, there is a need to talk about linguistic representation, because Searle is also talking about linguistic representation. He talks about mental representation and he also talks about the linguistic representation. The structure of intentional states and the structure of an expression are isomorphic and the common thing to these two structures is the semantic content. So, the content of thought and the content of an expression or the content of a mental states an intentional mental states like the desire that I talk about is same as the content of the expression of the desire. So, there is a kind of a common structure Sal talks about. When we talk about P, say for example, P is a mental state, then say S, S is a sentence, the expression of this intentional mental state. The content of P and the content of this sentence, the expression of the P are same, they are not two different things. So, that is something common. So, Sal talks about linguistic representation and Sal also talks about mental representations and they have the same logical structure. When we talk about meaning, we necessarily talk about linguistic representations. That is only when we would talk about the representational theory of mind advocated by say early Wittgenstein. Okay, when it talks about the picture theory of mind. 
but then later in the case of Searle you will find that Searle is saying this that philosophy of language is a branch of philosophy of action and that he clearly states in the speech acts when he talks about speech act theory the speech act is a performative act speaking a language or expressing a proposition or statement this is nothing but performing an action so speaking is an a kind of a peculiar action it is an intentional action for example when i order something please bring me a glass of water when i order something shut the door now this is an order and saying it to someone to shut the door so when i say this following my statement someone comes and shuts the door so that is where an action is performed when i a speech is uttered so the utterance is an intentional act i intended to do it i also intended that someone would close the door so this kind of analysis shows that it is not necessarily a kind of a mechanical action performed by the human individuals or the human beings rather it is connected with mind now this connection as i said earlier is a kind of an intentional connection connection that is been established through the semantic content and intentionality is basically a kind of a semantic property of the mind now when i say this how does sir show this connection such so, as when i'm passing this order i'm all suspecting that somebody would come and close the door so my intention has two components one i am intending to perform this and i performed and and it also has an expectation or a desire behind it the desire is somebody would come and the desire gets satisfied when somebody comes and closes the door now this intentional activities are so complex when you talk about satisfaction we cannot exempt this case that i am not experiencing it i feel happy when somebody comes and closes the door because that is what i intended or if i pass or if i make a request thinking that my order will not work but if i make a request it would work i would succeed in making that event possible then i say please close the door and i also expect in this case that my hearer would respond to my request and if the hearer following my request closes the door then i feel happy so sir says that the condition of satisfaction is an important criterion to show that linguistic activities are related to certain mental activities because it is generating the kind of a satisfaction 
which is experiential in nature. And when I say, therefore, saying and meaning go together. I am saying it and I must mean that, what I am saying. So, there is some kind of a logical connection Sal tries to draw when Sal talks about speech act and its relationship with the mind. It is not just the kind of commonality that we talk about when you talk about the semantic content, content flowing from the intentional mental states to the world. So, the kind of direction Sal talks about, the direction of which that the language represents the world. So, this is a kind of a intentional fit or Sal calls as the direction of fit. It is a kind of a direction of fit that language, the mind to the world direction of fit, language and mind, I, I, I am putting them together for our benefit to explain. In the, in the case of speech act theory, it was language to the world. In the case of speech work theory, when you take a particular statement into account, you will find that a promise is directed towards the world or an order is directed towards the world or there is a kind of a fitness between the la statement and the world. When I am thinking about making a statement, now that prior intention, intention before performing an action or intention before performing speech has many sub intentional states. So, my expectation or a desire is part of that prior intention. That is to say that when I am making a request, I also have this desire in my mind that my request would succeed. So, in that case, Sal says that there is an experiential component attached to it, a component which is attached to understanding. So, how can the computational model which talks about mental representation would ignore this fact that meaning is also connected to mind. Now, there are philosophers who talk about meaning exists in the mind, but Sarl is not making that kind of claim. Sarl in fact argues against this very thesis that meaning is not there in the mind. Sarl is not an internalist in this sense. I will talk about it in my later classes, how Searle is not an internalist, he is an externalist. So, therefore, he would say that whenever we perform linguistic activities and talk about objectivity or talk about truth etcetera, we need to have different presuppositions in mind, but we cannot ignore this fact that that expressions or sayings or the use of words or speech act in particular is not connected to our experience and understanding. So, when we discuss about the notion of mental representation, one must keep this in mind that the Fodorian theorization of mental representation tries to talk about 
the computational perspective through which the representational states explains the semantic content. And when we speak about the Searlian notion of mental representation, we must see how the linguistic representations are linked to consciousness. In other words, they are linked to experience and understanding, feeling etcetera, etcetera. In that sense, we can revise the statement that the birth of meaning is the birth of linguistic representation. So, there is a kind of a moment in which the linguistic representation is you know, taking a shape, taking a form and for Searle, the linguistic representation takes a form through the intentional feature of the mind. If we suspend the intentional attitude that Searle is talking about, saying that it is, it is a irreducible feature, then probably we can think along with the Wittgensteinian, the, the, the early Wittgensteinian, who says, now this is how language functions, or this is how the thought represents the realities. Now, if we take the intentional attitude of the mind, the mind that articulates linguistic expressions, we will be able to explain the concept of meaning. Representation in this sense shows how does language speak about the world. Now, the being about the world for Searle, it is a kind of a pre linguistic concept, because Searle is presupposing this fact that intentionality is one of the first evolutionary phenomena. Human minds are primarily intentional and then Sal talks about language. So, in that order of evolution, intentionality comes first. So, there is a kind of a pre linguistic concept which makes this aboutness possible, makes this directedness possible. And if you look at the Wittgensteinian thinking, then language is autonomous, language is considered as a kind of an autonomous principle. So, where language speaks about itself. Now, one can very well critique Searle's position when Searle talks about the nature of intentional content or the nature of the semantic content. Can Sal tell us that this is when the semantic content is formed and can we really separate the intentional state and the semantic content. So, the my criticism would be that intentionality is basically a kind of a linguistic feature and language and mind are intrinsically related. So, there I would be adhering to Wittgensteinian presuppositions, thinking that language is something very important to talk about meaning. And I will also not ignore this fact that human mind experiences things, human mind understands things and this understanding, experiencing etcetera are all linguistic or semantic activities. So, in that sense one can read Searle more critically or the Searlean perspective 
of linguistic representation more critically. And the Fodorian understanding of mental representation more critically. So, when we talk about meaning world relationship, we talk about how language is connected to the world, they are built into each other. So, there is a kind of a structural isomorphism between language and the world. As I have mentioned, that representation has been theorized particularly the scientific, the Searlian notion of representation is being theorized, keeping Frege and Wittgenstein's notion of meaning, where these philosophers talk about the logical relationship between language and the world. But one can also bring in the later Wittgensteinian notion of meaning, where language is basically a means of communication. So, what is important? in the later Wittgenstein is that communication rather than representation. Searle's theorization of meaning includes the linguistic representation and the mental representation, where Searle says that there is a communicative intention and there is a representational intention. The intention to speak, the intention to perform is presupposing a fact that there is a representational intention involved in this. But think of a situation where I am not just representing things, but I am representing it to someone meaning thereby I am trying to communicate my ideas, my thoughts, my mental states, my desires, my beliefs to someone. So, when Sal says that there are two aspects to representation, communication and mere representation. So, the communicative intention is important. So, we need to find out this fact, whether Sal is accommodating the two Wittgensteinian perspectives, the early Wittgensteinian perspective, where he says thoughts are representational, proposition represents the reality or the picture of reality thoughts are better picture of reality and thereby the whole representational model which talks about the picture theory of meaning refers to the notion of mental and the later Wittgensteinian model where the meaning is theorized referring to the language, language game and form of life. If one finds the communicative intention, please an important role in explicating meaning. So, there are two models we need to see here keeping all this thing in mind. How does Searle advocate the theory of meaning? Would explain it in the next class. Thank you.